welcome to the Movement Upgraded podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jen Hostler, licensed physical therapist and certified strength and mobility coach. Here you can expect to hear about all things movement. The Movement Upgraded podcast is a blend of the science of strength training, rehab, and mobility mixed with the personal and professional experience to provide you with the steps you need to keep your body pain-free and moving well so you can do what you love forever. Welcome back to the Movement Upgraded podcast. I have Dr. Ryan here. Say hello. Hey, hey. Thanks for letting me come back on. <laughs> I must have not been too terrible. Yeah, so I. it's one thing to be on the podcast by yourself where you're just kind of feeling like you're talking into the abyss. And I'm obviously picturing everybody that I'm talking to. But without feedback, sometimes I get lost in my thoughts. Um, and that's really easy for me to do. Ryan can probably... Um, He's smiling here. He knows. He yeah. can vouch for that. Hopefully I can give her some uh, cues, whether it be nonverbal or just chime in here and there to help guide the conversation. He also has a unique perspective, I feel like, sometimes. So he's really good at filling in the gaps that I might have missed because he has his own experience as a clinician and strength coach and mobility specialist. So we have him here to um, start the first of several episodes we're going to do interspersed throughout the podcast where we kind of pick a body part and we're going to talk about kind of addressing the mobility deficits in that body part, maybe talking about some specific limitations we see, just like common things that we see in the office. And it'll hopefully help you kind of look at things from a different lens or maybe consider some things you hadn't before. That's kind of our goal. And I did a poll on Instagram about this and everybody was kind of excited about it. Um, They were excited, one, to have Ryan back, which is awesome. Um, I think he's pretty great, but I'm super biased. But (laughs) um, so he is back to help me kind of talk about these things. And I did a poll asking what things or what specific body parts we'd want to hear first and hip one. So today we're going to start with the hip and these are all going to be titled very much based off of the Friends episodes because I'm a very big Friends fan. Um, I converted Ryan into being a Friends fan. We watch them almost every night before bed unless we find like a a show that we really like. So we're big Friends fans. And so if you got the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Reference, as you saw the title, then you are our people. If not, it's totally fine. We don't like you as much. I'm just kidding. Um, we, we still like, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to love friends. We can be friends with people who don't love all the same things that we do. Um, crazy, right? So anyways, let's get started with talking about the hip. So I think I may ask Ryan to start just to see how he feels about that. But what do you feel like is like the, the most important thing that you do for anybody coming in who needs to work on their hip mobility? I would say I start with just looking at them moving their hip. How, how can you move your hip? How well can you move your hip? And how well can you move your hip without using other parts of your body? Mm-hmm. And then from there, we can break things down to look at, well, from like a range of motion standpoint, putting them on the table, looking at their individual ranges of motion of their hip, maybe understanding why they then moved their hip the way that they did. Yeah, I think it's really important to... One, just see like, what does your hip movement look like? And I I think every single, I've never assessed anybody who doesn't compensate in any other way, shape or form. And so what he's talking about and just looking at them moving their hip is just hip cars. So we've talked about cars in this podcast before, but they stand for controlled articular rotations. And the, the gist of it is just taking your hip through its full range of motion. So we're just looking at all the options of your hip. What does it look like when I ask you to do a hip car or move your hip? I think every single person ends up moving their spine. It's just how much they end up moving their spine with their hip. And uh, most people, when they start to do cars and we're using them as an assessment, are like, I'm going to get an A on this test and I'm going to give you as much movement as possible. Like, (laughs) you can always tell different personalities, but like most people who work with us are like, I'm getting an A here. And for them, they interpret that as just like as big movement, as big of movement as possible. And... For us, usually our first goal is, all right, 
let's try that again. And I don't know what Ryan does because I've never in the sessions with him, but I'll usually put my hands like on their pelvis and like help them um, not move their spine. And so it's a significant reduction in how much movement they have. And the step number one in all cars is really make them smaller and more controlled before we even care about how big they are. So I don't really want range of motion. And so everybody, when they interpret their, um, the cars and what they want to get an A on, right? They interpret that as getting big movement, but the A on the test is really quality of movement quality first yes it is can we make sure it's only from the hip and that is always number one so from there we always will assess that because also that's everybody's homework when they first work with us because the more people we can get doing cars the less people probably that will be in our office and it's just the simplest like low-hanging fruit that we can do and then from there we have to figure out okay well maybe why do they compensate so much with their spine um do they not even have that like capacity can they not get their their hip in those movements and so their spine has to take over whether that's because we run out of space in the joint or we just don't have the strength that's where we break everything down and look at what options they have on like a breakdown of those movements so that was the second part of what ryan said like first i just want to see what does it look like when you move your hip yep and, and you can always come up with thoughts of what you're going to find when you get them onto the table to actually assess and more often than not, we tend to be right, but we'd never want to just guess and we actually want to put them on the table and figure out what's going on. Because I've been wrong before. Yeah. Not very often. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, same. But it does happen. And so like I like to assume or I like to, I will call this, I like to create hypotheses in my brain and it's like my brain playing its own game of like, can I figure it out? Like, is this what's going to happen? And um, sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. Um, more often with the more experience that I've been, I can kind of figure out, okay, when they bring their hip into these positions, they move their spine in these ways. And so usually the people who have those kind of patterns, they have a similar pattern that shows up when I assess their movement and break all the movements down. But we always have to literally look at, okay, what does their hip have the capability of doing in flexion? What does it have the capability of doing in internal rotation, external rotation, extension, um, abduction, adduction? Those are all the movements that we look at. There's our entire assessment for the hip yeah. pretty much. Um, and so we look at two different things when it comes to looking at the hip. We look at what their passive range of motion is and what their active control or their active range of motion is. And Jen did a podcast on this. I think it was the mobility versus flexibility episode. And she explains exactly what those two things are. And both are very important because if you don't have the passive range of motion to even be able to move into a certain position, then your active range of motion is going to be limited. Yeah, you can't have, a, like if you don't have the passive range of motion, if gravity or me, like I can't move you, then you're not gonna have the strength to, to do it because the option isn't doesn't exist. Contrary, we can have a lot of options where like one, like a clinician like me or Ryan or gravity can like move you into a lot of positions, but when we ask you to hold it or we ask you to use your own muscles that cross that joint to do that movement, you can't do it because you're not strong enough in that position. And usually people fall in one of two camps, um, but a lot of people can be a little bit of both depending on the joint and the movement we're looking at. So it's very rare that you'll find one person who lacks only passive range of motion in all of their joints and in every movement, and they just need to stretch, or a person who lacks active range or control or strength in every position, in every movement, at every joint. Usually it's a combination of both. And sometimes we see this like argument on social media of you don't need to stretch your hip flexors. You need to strengthen them. And I think I've talked about this on Instagram. It's, it can be both. <laughs> it can. And more often than not is both because um, we can have a lack of strength in a hip flexion position. So a shortened position of that muscle. And then we can have a lack of strength um, or a lack of ability to lengthen or stretch in the opposite range of motion. And so a muscle, a muscle's length and a muscle's strength are not always directly correlated. And I think that's the biggest example that most people don't fully understand. So can you break that down a little bit more? Like explain that a little bit slower <laughs> or explain so, that one more time because it's something that 
it's important. People, people it's important. don't understand. Yeah, it's and it's super important. So if I think about my hip flexor, they those muscles um, attach to my spine and they attach to my femur. So that's like my um, thigh bone or your leg bone. When I contract them, they shorten. Right. So an, a concentric contraction is when the muscle shortens. So if I were to do that right now, or you were to do that, shortening your muscle is going to bring your knee up towards your chest. That is mm-hmm. hip flexion. The strength and ability of our hip flexors to pull our knee up is the strength of those hip flexors in that position. I can be strong, like lifting my leg right off the ground, but weak as it comes up into my chest. So like the further I get into a closing angle position or into my full range of motion, the less range or the less strength I might have. Mm-hmm. So that can be true now. And for, and let's just build upon that. So like if you wanted to take your, if you were able to take your knee all the way up to your chest with your hand pulling it up there Mm -hmm. and then you were to slowly let go with your hand and then contract those hip flexors to your max ability would you be able to hold that knee up towards your chest yes or no and if you're not able to do that and you lose some of that range and that knee falls away from your chest this is a great example that you lack some hip flexion strength then to build upon this jen's going to explain how you can have limited ability of that hip flexor to also stretch. So that's where I think she's going next. (laughs) Uh, This is why we brought Ryan on because it's helpful to um, kind of break things down a little bit. So yeah, so he was just explaining what like a test would be for determining the difference between your active and passive range of motion. So bringing your hand and pulling your knee up to your chest, you can do this right now and trying to get it all the way up without your spine moving, then contracting those hip flexors, letting go of your hands and trying to maintain the position. Um, The amount your leg falls is just the difference between how much strength you have and how much um, passive range of motion or options you have. So when you have a big deficit there, um, we're just lacking strength really in that position right because strength is angle specific so again you can be strong in one position not another so and that is usually plus or minus about 15 degrees but that depends on the joint so that can be true or like can be a problem for you or not a problem but the opposite movement is going to be what that muscle limits so hip flexors again we talked about how they cross the front of the hip joint so um, they attach to my spine the front of my hip as i go to bring my leg back so let's think about pushing off when you go to walk or run so that leg is going behind you those hip flexors are now lengthening so they're getting longer and they're going to get into a stretched position Mm -hmm. you can have muscles that cannot lengthen all the way like that's totally possible and now we cannot reach our full hip extension range of motion so you can have muscles that need to be stretched to open that up and you can have muscles that also need to be strengthened to pull your leg into the opposite position so now you can see how those things are kind of related but they're not actually and so a lot of people will be like you don't need to stretch your hip flexors you need to strengthen them um it really isn't those two things are not mutually exclusive so your hip flexors we need to talk about what movement we're trying to get people better at or or the why. So when it comes to you don't need to stretch, you need to strengthen, or you don't need to strengthen, you need to stretch. Like for what? That's the question we need to be asking because that is complete or incomplete advice. Um, and it's not helpful and it's actually more confusing. So when we think about different muscles, we need to think about, well, what is our goal? If the goal is pain, right? Well, that's more complicated. <laughs> we want to make sure that we basically address any limitations um, and make sure the the joint is working nice and address all of the other factors that I've talked about in the other pain um, episodes. But if the goal is maybe to reduce stiffness or maybe the goal is to improve your ability to do a movement, well, then it's actually pretty similar, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not just one or the other. It's often, let's look at your assessment. What is your hip capable of? What are you lacking? And let's address those things. So you can lack hip extension and you can lack lack hip extension range of motion and you can lack hip flexion range of motion um, for different reasons. So hopefully that's Yeah, and I think that one of the biggest things, like a mindset shift would be, let's not think about the muscles. Let's think about the joint and what are the movements that the joint does can that joint do that movement, yes or no? If it cannot, why? 
And if it can, is it strong there to yeah. produce full range of movement? And we really, it really boils down to passive versus active range of motion in, in movement specific. So hip extension, do I have the passive range of motion? Like, can I move my patient or client passively through that um, movement? And then from there, what's their active range of motion? So what can they do? If I cannot passively move them there, they're not going to be able to figure it out with their muscle strength. I can't even do it. So we start with, let's make sure that the we stretch the muscles that are limiting that movement. So it's always going to be, if we are moving into one direction, the muscles that perform the opposite action, so the opposite side of the joint, are the ones that would be limiting that. So we wanna think about that. Now that's on a very superficial level. There are some reasons that we might not have passive range of motion in every direction or in multiple directions, and that is, if the joint itself is super stiff and we don't have a lot of joint space. And that's the other thing I really wanted to talk about, kind of like leads us right into... Um, kind of like the biggest, most important part of focusing on hip mobility. Yeah. We kind of skipped... Um, I, I wanted to get it's all that... Right, I, but we're, we're good on going on tangents <laughs> because it's all good information. Hopefully you're still sticking around with us. Yeah. So understanding active and passive deficits and just like what we talked about, I think is just... Or passive versus active range of motion mm-hmm. is what I meant to say. It's just really important because um, that principle just it applies to everything else we're talking about now from here what's really important is making sure that you're working on the joint from the inside out because if we are talking about hip flexion and hip extension um, again what I was discussing was like hip flexors and those superficial tissues so we're thinking about muscles in the fitness world and even rehab sometimes is really obsessed with muscles and it's fine those are part of our body but we really ignore all of the other stuff that can affect our movement. And if we really tackle the stuff, I'm I'm like putting quotes of stuff, like the um, hip capsule, for example, the stuff that's like the deepest part of the joint and work on the deepest part inside out, yes, it will take longer usually, but you're addressing everything that's superficial um, on the way as you, you kind of do those things. Yeah, addressing the muscles, you're not necessarily addressing the deep joint capsule or the joint stuff, but by tackling the joint capsule and the joint itself, you're still working all the more superficial muscles and all that stuff. And you may need to eventually work on the superficial muscles, but the superficial muscles aren't gonna be able to overpower a lack of joint space. So the way that we kind of like to explain this, and I don't, I, I'm, this is probably something that was explained in FRC, but when we think about joint space, we think about a joint in general. It's where two joint, two bones come together. Um, and so the point of that joint is movement. Otherwise, it just would have been one long fused bone, right? So that's like the first thing I like people to understand. The second thing is those two bones are not right on top of each other. We have joint space in between those bones. And when we look at x-rays and MRIs, we're looking at that joint space and trying to make sure that it's maintained. And when that joint space isn't maintained very well and we have a lot of that quote unquote bone on bone, usually just is some of the first signs of arthritis. So we want to make sure that we have lots of room in that joint for movement. Um, Less room just means less mobility, less options for us, which is the opposite of what we're trying to do with mobility. So when we think about that joint space, it is maintained when we have all of the integrity of the stuff that surrounds the joint, um, giving us the ability to just like move. So when we have those bones sitting right by each other, they're obviously not floating in space, right? We have the muscles, we have fascia, we have tendons, and then we have this really deep ligamentous like tissue that's really thick, like very thick and not super stretchy. And as we don't move for a very long time, that stuff kind of can become like unhealthy, it can become super stiff, and the tighter and less pliable that stuff becomes, the less joint space we have. So over time, we start to lose joint space and our joint tissues or our capsular tissues become stiff and less pliable. And if you think about the joint space as kind of like having a closet, if you've had like a really, really tiny closet, there's not much space in there for you to do anything in. I love this analogy. I do too. (laughs) But if you have the pliable, nice, 
um, healthy capsular tissue with a lot of joint space, you're now upgrading from like this tiny little closet to maybe you have like a nicer double door closet. And now you have a little bit more room and space to do things, to put stuff in. Um, and then if you upgrade from there, maybe you have like a walk-in closet and you're like, wow, there's so much room for activities. <laughs> and um, Man, I wanted to say that, but I'm you sorry. took it right out of my mouth. I know. <laughs> Movie quotes are kind of um, one of my favorite things. I love it. Actually, to the point that one of my patients, when he like discharged from working with me, bought me a book that was like movie quotes for different occasions. Yeah, John's really good at movie quotes. That's yeah. Total side note. We're I'm, working on I'm Ryan's terrible. ability. <laughs> um, anyways, so you basically can kind of see how we're moving into, okay, more joint space equals more options for movement, more options to do things. So when we think about that, if we improve the joint space and improve the capsular tissue, we're now improving our ability to do anything with that joint. And the way that we kind of assess how much joint space you have is... Drum roll. (laughs) (laughs) Through rotation. Yeah, so for every joint except the spine. So the spine plays by its own set of rules. Um, Maybe we'll talk about that in the spine episode, but today we're just gonna talk about the hip. So the hip is a ball and socket joint. So really, rotation is like the only thing that happens at that joint. But when we're assessing rotation, we're looking at how much ability to move do we have in that capsule? How much joint space do we have? People who have a lot of like pinchiness in their hips or they just feel like um, their hips are really sticky, Uh, maybe their like squat depth is really limited, they can't get down and play on the ground very easily. Like a lot of the quote unquote like typical like oh, I'm getting old type of concepts is really just a lack of capsular tissue pliability yep. and a lack of joint space. That the closing angle stuff or that pinching is definitely a really big part of it. And so if those people um, come in my office, almost ev- like one of my, I think one of my recent patients said she felt like her hip felt sticky, like there is gum inside of it. And so <laughs> capsular tissue is like that dried Like when it's not super healthy, it can be like that. It's just already really thick to start. But um, once we kind of get less pliability in it, it just becomes super stiff and hard to work through. So when we're assessing people, this is why we prioritize rotation. Like we just, we're gonna look at that hip. Does it rotate? Like, can I move it even like passively? And if I can't move it and you, and I can't get that hip to rotate, you're probably like, that's what we're just going to do that. So like, that's going to be the focus. And when we talk about rotation specifically for anybody that doesn't know, it's just looking at internal and external rotation at the hip. Yeah. And I mean, there's different positions that you could look at that, but we typically just start in a very simple position because you don't have to overcomplicate things. And so we'll bring that. And this one position gives you a really good idea of what their hip is able to do in other positions. Yeah. And so, Uh, We just kind of bring that knee and hip into like a 90-90 position. We make sure they don't have any pinching or anything like that. And then just kind of checking like, can we internally, externally rotate their knee? I kid you not, the people who have really limited hip capsule. Internally, externally rotate their hip. It might look like you're moving the knee and the leg, but it's actually movement that's happening in the hip. Because we're looking at like that femur rotating within the acetabulum. Yeah. Which is your hip joint. So going back... The, from a fundamental position, imagine that the person that we're assessing is just laying on their back and their knee and their hip are bent up to like 90 degree angles. And then from there, rotating that foot up towards their shoulder, that would be looking at hip external rotation mm-hmm. with that thigh being vertical and then rotating their hip into internal rotation while that thigh is still vertical. That'd be like rotating the foot out. Away from and yeah, body. most people, they will think, and the way that Jen explained it is uh, it looks like the the knee is doing the movement, but that's actually rotation happening through the hip, internal like, and external rotation. That was like one of the hardest things I think in PT school was understanding hip rotation. Um, now as like a clinician, I it's like so obvious to me. Well, people but. still get so confused, even our patients. Like you'll rotate their foot out and they'll think, well, you're rotating my foot out. That's that external. that's external, right? And it's like, rotation. <laughs> well, no, that's actually internal because you're looking again at, at the, thigh. the thigh or yeah, at the, at the hip joint itself. Yeah, that's usually, so that was a good clarification. Your knee is going to go in the opposite direction, so. But we knew you guys understood that because you're all <laughs> very smart. <laughs> um, yeah, 
So that is what we're gonna always look at and restore first. And in many cases, if you start to make the capsule work better and give them more options within that deep part of the joint, you won't have to work so hard on the other things. So this is kind of one of those like life hacks that makes all of the other things you do give you a more of an ROI for your time. So sometimes you don't have to address a ton more of hip flexion because they just run out of room. So if you think about two joint, two bones, like really close together, um, they're gonna kind of like run into each other very quickly. If you have like your two hands, like your knuckles facing each other and you try to rotate and move them, you probably can't figure out what I'm saying exactly because it's hard to explain movement over the podcast. But if you have your hands further apart, so we have more joint space in between those two bones, as you rotate them toward like around each other or move them um, which is what you're doing with your your body when you're moving you're going to have potentially no point of contact between those bones you're gonna have more joint space and then you can do more so that's just basically saying like I can move my my leg or my hip into all of the other ranges of motion or the other positions and because I've upgraded my closet uh, my closet space right I can go and move a ton more without running into the walls or getting those bones kind of touching each other or um, essentially what that feels like for most people is like a pinch in their hip or just feels really uncomfortable and pinchy and those are signs that your capsule or your like joint space are a little bit limited Um, and whether or not that is due to the capsular tissue being too tight or you don't have the control of the muscles that like maintain the joint space which would be the active range of motion Um, both are important, but where we always start is make sure that like passively they have those options. And if they don't, let's restore that and, um, do some hip cars and maybe a little bit of other stuff, but that's usually like going to get most people a pretty significant amount of success. It's just going to be repeated inputs after that over time. And let me just say this here. The deeper of the tissues we're working, the longer it's going to take to get, um, any sort of benefit and that kind of sucks as a clinician because I would love to give people like relief right away and no sometimes kidding. doing some of this like they'll feel a little bit better after a week or two um, but the true physiological changes that are going to last like that is just to me means the external tissues are starting to respond which is great but like the true deep part of the joint or really getting more space that's going to take months to years so keep that in mind like you you haven't developed these issues over like the last six weeks. It's been very much an accumulation of probably most of your life where you're slowly going down this like losing mobility and joint space very slowly over time because you probably weren't taught how to do cars to maintain it, which is really why we're so adamant about cars. Yep. <laughs> um, so we always start with the rotation and internal rotation specifically is one that I will always prioritize too. Um, external is gonna be important, but I definitely find that more people are limited in internal first and we usually will work on both at the same time if somebody's super limited in both of them, but ideally we wanna start and make sure that they just have those options. And then from there, if they have the passive range of motion, so they have that joint space, so I assessed it, I could move their hip, they seem like they have enough. By the way, enough is dependent on the person. Somebody who just wants to walk around and like feel good in their bodies at 75 years old is going to have a, a different number for enough than somebody who might be like 30 and wants to squat ass to grass. Like if if you want to do more with your hip and put your hip in more different positions that are more extreme, you're going to need a bit more um, joint space. And so you might have to work a little harder, be a little bit more patient, but um, keep that in mind that we have norms, but they are just where we start. It's like the bare minimum. And um, we don't want the bare minimum. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, This is what I love about the whole podcast thing is that you just talked about this with Dr. Emily Roush. Oh, yeah, that's right. how she works with pole dancers and pole dancers will go into uh, doctors and they're like, your range of motion's good. And they're like, well, I can't do the things that I love. Like, it might be good for the average person, but it's not good enough for what I like to do. Yeah. So you always need to keep that in mind. Everything is specific to the activities that you perform and it's specific to your body so I can like give a quick little um spiel about that because I had and then yet again coming back to podcast (laughs) this is talked about in your uh hypermobility podcast too I think that's where you're going people yeah people who are hypermobile or tend to be a little bit more on the hypermobile spectrum are going to need their norm quote unquote for their bodies is going to be different because 
that's how their bodies are. And after my ACL surgery, the PT restored me to whatever his, my range of motion, to whatever his norms were. And I had reached a normal amount of knee extension according to him, but what I actually realized, and I've had chronic knee issues ever since, um, that finally I think have gotten way better over the past like, what, five years of really Mm -hmm. working on, five, six years of working on this stuff. But I had two things that he did, three things he didn't really restore. Number one, he never restored internal rotation or external rotation. I think I was fine with external. I was limited with internal in my knee. Different story for a different podcast, but that's the capsular stuff. Like, we never even addressed that. And the ACL is important for rotation, so that's silly. But it, Can I chime in right here? Yeah. Because you said he didn't restore it, and I want to just kind of clarify oh, yeah. that, like, he didn't provide Jen with the education, the tools, and the knowledge, and the exercises for her to put in the work to restore that range of motion. Right. Like, a therapist... They're, they should be there to help and guide you and give you the education and empower you to be able to do these things. I don't want you to feel like you have to rely on a on therapist. That, yeah. And Jen and I talked about this on our ex, <laughs> in our uh, podcast episode, Cairo versus PT. Yes, like, it's you not... want to be empowered to do the things on your own. So unfortunately, she wasn't given the tools and knowledge that she needed to uh, be able to restore that internal rotation of her knee. And I wouldn't have known any better. I was 14 at the time. Yeah. So like it's in, and, and so I say he didn't, but yeah. he just never, I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> he never prioritized that in our, in our programming. Right. So, um, that was part of it. I was also not the best, most compliant patient when I was younger, but I also looking back at it, he didn't really spend the time yeah. in, if you in don't know why you're doing it. it yeah. You're not going to do there it. It just wasn't, it wasn't, uh, everything that I am now is a, is a byproduct of the experiences that I've had. And I do the opposite with a lot of my people. Same. But, um, one of the things that he also didn't do, or he did not facilitate in my programming in my rehab was rebuilding the strength of my leg. And there were several inches of muscle mass I never regained. Um, and I'm still working. I think my thighs are way closer in, um, in muscle tissue, but it's really hard to do a lot of single leg work only. It's just (laughs) exhausting. And it's not a priority of mine right now is what I should really say. But the most, I still think you look good, babe. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> um, just a little asymmetrical, but whatever. Um, I'm already crooked, so it's just expected at this point. But the thing that I wanted to bring up is that he did not restore enough knee extension. So we worked on knee extension, in, again, in, his, in the rehab process. Um, we worked on knee extension. I had a lot that I was working on, but it was normal for the quote-unquote norms that clinicians were given but it was not enough for my body i have a significant amount of knee hyperextension when i stand on the other leg i barely can reach it on my acl leg and that's something i would say that was more recent in me um discovering and again i haven't prioritized it um a significant amount so i'm kind of doing more of maintenance work here and there i'll work on it when it's flared up but it's just again not a priority of mine right now because I have other things that I'm prioritizing but I have the knowledge now to understand if my knee flares up kind of what's going on and it's really important that I have that range motion because it's that's what's normal for me and that's one of the things that really bothers me about a lot of clinicians is just like taking these standards and norms that were taken from like a general population which general population is not active and they're not healthy. So I don't really know why those are the standards, but um, we have those standards and then we have like some idea of what it takes to do normal day-to-day tasks, which are fine, but like most people need to exercise and then they need bodies that are capable of doing the types of exercise they do. So we need more than just that. And making sure that we're individualizing those ranges of motion is really important. Yep. So bringing that all the way back to the hip. Yeah. Why are we talking about the knee? Because it applies to the yes. hip. This applies to the, every joint, really. The principles are still yep. applicable, which is why uh, one of the things I loved about FRC especially. But um, back to the hip, it's going to depend on you, your goals, and what you want to do with your hip in, in general. So starting with rotation is always where we go. And then from there, we're going to look at all of the other movements and see if you have any big active passive deficits. But I think I didn't touch on what happens if we don't have active control of, re- of internal and external rotation. I don't think I went through that. I think mm-hmm. we just talked about passive. So passive is really important for the joint space. Active control is really important for maintaining the joint space. So if you're somebody who's hypermobile and you have lots of options in that joint space, making sure that it's maintained so that we are not um, like 
having the, what's the word that I'm looking for? Having the joint space, that's not the word. <laughs> I'm no help on this one. <laughs> It can help when we're moving, maintain the joint space so we are not having our bones kind of pinch, oh, essentially. Oh, you're looking for the word centration. Yes. Yeah, centri- the joint being centered or centrated and have adequate amounts of space in all directions yes. around that joint. Yeah, so when we're going to move, you want to have, like there's like smaller muscles that we don't usually address and um, those are, and maybe they're bigger muscles, but in the ways that they're utilized for internal external rotation, we don't train. And if we don't train those movements, we don't necessarily get those adaptations or we start to lose them. And being able to actively control internal and external rotation is important in maintaining joint space and important for keeping your hip specifically doing what it does. Because in every direction, if you think about a ball and socket joint, even if I flex, extend, as I'm moving it in every direction, it's really just spinning or rolling or rotating in the joint. So we really wanna make sure that we can control that rotation so we get the coupled movements that are supposed to happen at the joint. So it's a little bit of orthopedic lingo for you, but if you were wondering why you need to work on your hip internal rotation control and strength when it doesn't look quote unquote functional, um, that's why, because you don't realize when you're actually using rotation tissues or requiring them. Like one of my favorite examples, which um, I talked about here and there, is the ability to get a strong leg drive in the bottom of a squat. We actually need a bit of internal rotation. If you watch people who are super strong, like some of the Olympic weightlifters, they kind of go into that knee valgus, which is actually beneficial for them because they're finding a good position to drive straight out of the hole. And um, I think sometimes we we lose that ability when we cue things like shove your knees out mm-hmm. into an already externally rotated position. So then the knees, we just we lose that ability to you generate. Don't even, yeah, you don't even allow your femur to go into that internal ro- internal rotation moment to be able yeah. to create that force yeah. and that drive out of the hole. And for some people, when they're already in a wide stance, that's kind of like jamming their ball and socket joint into a, an uncomfortable position. Um, and so I understand where those cues are coming from sometimes, but um, I think we're trying to correct a non-problem. Um, knee valgus is not a problem. Fitness would never do such a thing. <laughs> um, especially in the movement world. Yeah. So knee valgus is a non-problem most of the time. We just want to make sure it's controlled. And I think a lot of um, people think that that knee valgus, by the way, is when you're standing or squatting and your knees go inside of your ankles, your arches collapse, and we kind of have like a dynamic hip internal rotation knee external rotation, like that's that valgus movement. Um, And it's kind of been demonized for a lot of different reasons, but it's a normal occurrence. It's just problematic when it's like uncontrolled. And when I'm doing, or when we're doing like hip assessments, a lot of people who have a significant amount of that actually just don't have hip internal rotation. So everybody's like trying to work on this external rotation and glute strength. And it's um, interesting because when we actually assess them, they actually have super limited hip internal rotation, whether that's the passive range of motion and capsular space, or it's actually just strength. They're limited in one or both of those very often, not every time. But this is why going back to what Ryan said, we don't just guess what people are doing. We assess and see what they're limited in because there's a handful of reasons that might happen and not every time it happens, is it problematic? And if we just make sure that a hip does what a hip needs to do and has the strength and control of all the options it has and has enough options, um, most often the body will organize itself really well and we won't have to sit there and over cue somebody. Also, when you have better control and awareness of all those movements, your cues are going to be, um, like the cues are going to be way easier to execute. So talk about like a, a big ROI for an investment in your time, mobility work, is so freaking painful not painful it shouldn't be painful but like mentally painful and like exhausting and annoying and tedious and boring like all of the things that painfully slow (laughs) yeah painfully (laughs) slow um and but it's like one of those things that like it's such hard work that when you get millimeters of progress, you're like overjoyed. Um, and then when that compounds and you finally reach a breakthrough, then you realize like all of the other things you're doing in fitness, you get a way bigger ROI, which is like really freaking cool. And I can only say that after working on mobility for a very long time. Um, it's not going to create this perfect life for you or you never get injured or never in pain. Like I, I will say that um, because sometimes I think that's like touted around in the in the space but it does give you the ability to just like 
try less hard in fitness and get more out of it. Um, which I think is pretty fascinating mm-hmm. and pretty cool, but it's only a byproduct of making things really freaking hard to start. Yeah. If you haven't, if you don't know how like mobility work is or kin stretch or haven't done any of that type of work, I, pales rails and like lift offs and passive range holds, all those types of things. Um, you can go try a week of our kin stretch uh, membership for free if you want to check it out, but you didn't try like a class or two, but it is very... It's a um, different kind of hard. Yes, it's it, <laughs> it's internal strength training versus focusing on those external muscles. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's like why... It's one of those reasons that I like it too, because it really helps you facilitate a growth mindset um, versus if you are somebody who kind of has more of a fixed mindset where you're just kind of like... Uh, you shut down at the, at the face of challenge or something along those lines. I was that way a lot when I was younger and it can be, it can actually affect your pain, but like mobility work, because it's so hard, you're just like, I don't want to do any of this. Like when I took the FRC course, I was pissed. <laughs> like I remember walking yeah. out of there like, this stuff is so hard. It's ridiculous. I don't feel like anybody does this in real life. Like I, I that was a, that's a fixed mindset in action, right? And I had seen the results from some of the colleagues that I knew and, and the science was fascinating. Like I really, really loved the science. Um, but once we started implementing it, I was like, fuck this. Yeah, it goes, <laughs> it definitely goes two ways. You have those perfectionist type A people who are like, I suck at this. I'm going to get better at this. And then you have the people who are like, no, fuck this. I'm never doing this. I hate well, it. Well, I'm a type A, <laughs> but I'm a type A with a growth mindset now, but I was a type A with a bad mindset okay. or a, a fixed mindset. And yeah. I was like, fuck this. I'm not good at it. I'm never doing it again. <laughs> like that was me for a long time. And then I was like, maybe there's something to this. And um, the more that I've put into it, the more I've gotten out of it, which is like one of those cliche things, but it's true <laughs> with mobility work. So it's just, it's slow progress because of how we're moving uh, across to like a whole process of understanding and getting awareness and then learning like how to um, implement that. And that's just like something that really just takes time. It's just like any other skill you do. If you try to change a habit, you try to um, get better at the guitar, you're just not going to be super good at it right away. And to think so is almost like an entitlement because like, who are you to think that you can just skip all the steps that everybody else has to go through? Um, which if I said that to my prior self, I would have probably got pissed, but <laughs> I'm saying it now. Um, but back to the hip, is there anything else that you feel like is really important for people to understand about the hip and, and things that we see? I would say one thing that I would love to touch on, it just goes back to a, a simple self-assessment for your own squat stance. Mm-hmm. Just oh, yeah, be- that's good. Yeah, because a lot of people will have the pinching or the closing angle stuff in the front of their hip. And this is a whole other topic, but it it goes hand in hand with what I'm trying to say is that that is not your hip flexor stretching. Because what Jen talked about earlier was if your hip is going behind you in a hip extension, that's when your hip flexor would be on stretch. And when you're squatting, your hip, your knee is coming up towards your chest. That's actually in hip flexion. So it's not on stretch. What that is, is your hip being jammed or pinched or compromised and that soft tissue or whether it be the soft tissue or the joint on the front side of the hip is getting aggravated. So that's not ideal. And again, that's a sign that you need to prioritize some of that rotational stuff at the hip. But going back to the squat assessment, one of the easiest things that you can do to like maybe eliminate some of that closing angle stuff would be to just check out your squat stance and modify your stance to a position that's more conducive to your hip anatomy and your hip mobility. So the best way to do that again, go on your back and just lay there and then take your hands on your legs and pull your knees up towards your chest. Maybe you pull them straight up towards your chest and you have a narrow stance and you realize, wow, I don't really get much hip flexion or I have some of that pinching in my hips, it's not comfortable. Well, maybe take your knees out a little bit wider, a wider squat stance, maybe farther away from your chest. Mm -hmm. And maybe you notice you get more hip flexion. And maybe you notice that that pinching sensation on the front of your hip goes away. Well, maybe you should try to utilize that squat stance when you're squatting. And you might notice that it feels way better because you're working with your body instead of against your body. I feel like that's like one of the most important things is you can work on mobility and like we said it just takes a really long time 
But in the meantime, address what you're doing to match where you're at. And I think that's like one of the things that I see lacking in the fitness industry a lot is like we try to fit all of these people into these boxes of fitness that we've created with these like requirements for everybody, which is just so silly. It's like everybody, everybody that by the time they get in fitness most often um, has not done mobility stuff. They've their bodies are just not prepared for it. They probably haven't been super loaded. Um, and so because of that, we aren't prepared to just throw a barbell on their back and just be like, yeah, just squat ass to grass. And we do that a lot in the fitness industry in that um, is something that like I think just a simple, let's meet people where they are and let's just see what their joints are capable of and let's just make sure that we program things that meet them where they are and don't put them in positions they don't own yet. And mm -hmm or they don't feel pinching, like the hip flexion thing. So if I'm going down into a squat, let's modify the squat stance. Like, can we go wider and get like a good depth? If not, like does elevating their ankles or their heels help a little because now we're going to give them an arbitrary ankle because by the way, if your knees can't go over your toes and you're trying to go really far down, now your femurs are stuck backwards essentially and you're kind of jamming that hip socket. Mm -hmm. A lot of hip impingement issues um, are a byproduct after of a long time of trying to force yourself to be able to squat with flat shoes and go ass to grass when you're trying to do a narrow stance, you don't have ankle mobility or something like that. So just doing a wider stance like Ryan said are just figuring out like what stance feels good like if my knees are wider apart versus more narrow or a little bit more turned out yeah and when you're in that position too just with your knees on, when you're in that position of on your back and your knees are up to your chest you find that comfortable position from a hip standpoint peek down at your feet too look at where your feet are maybe you realize that like oh my feet are pointed out a little bit yes. maybe utilize that towing out a not, little in your squat. Not everybody needs to squat with their feet shoulder width and their toes pointed forward. And I'm looking at UK Star like for promoting that. <laughs> I love the work that Kelly Starrett did in Mobility Wild. Like I love it because it paved the way for me to be able to do the things that I'm doing and Ryan's doing and Movement Upgraded to even exist. His book was one of the first ones that I read back in the day with mobility stuff. I love it. And also we can move forward from the, th the stuff that he was recommending now that we know, things like let's stop trying to fit people all in these standards that are arbitrary that we just created based off of our own understanding or whatever. So you don't need to squat with your toes pointed forward. It means nothing about you as a person, like zero morality. You're still a good person. Yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> like your mobility, your movement, I tell people that all the time. It doesn't mean anything about you as a person. Um, it just means like let's just meet your body where it is and there's enough fitness shaming as it is. So. I want to see more of that. And again, if you have some of that pinching in your hip in the squat, we just want to make sure we check the, the stance. Maybe we need to elevate your heels again, like check the ankle mobility, like what's your options there and do you have it? Um, and then we just may need to limit your depth. Like you, you can do all of the other modifications you want, like Ryan and I are saying, but for some people, until they have the joint space they need, we just can't squat ass to grass, which is totally fine. And I have seen this, and this will kind of be the last soapbox I get on, I think, today. Um, can't make any promises, but... Well, I have one other thing I would like to cover. Okay, well, I'll let Ryan <laughs> but we do won't, that. we won't hold you for too much longer. But, um, now I lost my train of thought. I don't know, you're getting on a soapbox. Oh. <laughs> There is a lot of things in the fitness world that are perpetuated. One of the things that I see a lot is that whether or not you should squat deep. And everybody talks about it from the point of view of the squat, saying a deep squat is better because that's more natural. A deep squat is better because it places less stress on the knees and in certain areas of the body. Or a 90 degree angle squat is better because of this stress that it places on the body or because it's more natural or functional. And what I'd like you to remember is that all of that is nonsense um, to an extent because it doesn't matter what the squat is. I don't give a fuck about the squat. I care about what your hips and knees and ankles are capable of for squatting for you. What like what options do you have? I don't like I could come up with all these arbitrary things of what you need to do, but like they all are complete trash compared to what you're able to do. Like literally none of them matter. Um, and if you can't get your hip past 90 degrees, you can't get your hip past 90 degrees. You're not going to be able to do an ass to grass squat. And doing so in the end is going to compromise you. So the short term benefit is maybe you can squat ass to grass, right? Cool. What does that do for you in the long term? Potentially puts you at risk for not being able to be in the gym again because for a while because you've now injured your hip. And I don't want to fear monger you, but like if you feel pinching in your hip, that's a sign that something's not going 
right? That's not something you push into, which I'm looking at yogis because I've, I've heard, I haven't seen this in a class that I've taken, but they actually coach some of that compression in the front of the hip. If you bring your knee into your chest, you should not feel that compression. We don't want to push into that closing angle stuff. Like, no. So these are some of the things that are perpetuated in a different fitness communities that I think are problematic. And it's just really important to understand we need to meet our bodies where they are. Mm -hmm. And the more you can know about your body, the better. And that's what I feel like Brian and I try to do all day long is just teach people about their bodies. They'll come in for the assessment and we'll be like, hey, George, meet your hip. Meet your hip. You've been together for like 42 years and you've never met your hip. You don't know anything about your hip. Every time you try to move your hip, your spine is doing the work and your back hurts. No wonder your back is working so hard for other joints. Like nobody likes doing the work for everybody else. So um, that's my little end of spiel that we just don't, not everybody needs to squat ass the grass. If that is a goal of yours, cool. If you don't care, maybe you don't need to. Maybe it's best for like some glute development, but you can also do other glute movements that will challenge your glutes. So don't let anybody in the fitness world shame you for not being able to squat ass to grass. The end. Goodbye. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what was the, the, uh, yeah, the last, last thing, thing that Ryan wanted to say? Yeah. Last thing I wanted to add was you can go and either self-assess your hip or we can assess your hip and you can have perfect passive range of motion and active ranges of motion, but you can still have some of that hip pinching. And this can be because you're stuck in an anterior pelvic tilt mm -hmm. when you're squatting. And if you think about it, if you're in an anterior pelvic tilt, that front space of your hip is already closed down because mm -hmm. you're just living in that position. So then when you try to go into more hip flexion, you have less movement at that joint. So sometimes we need to just work on some breath position core stability stuff and maybe Learning maybe to control your pelvis basically right yeah controlling the pelvis to start in a better neutral position so you are essentially starting at neutral right and then have more hip flexion to access i think what's really important is to understand this is kind of getting into a little posture talk which we're not going to go down that rabbit hole today but posture is not good or bad there's no better or worse postures but what you have to understand about a posture is it's a position that somebody's starting in and so if you think about the pelvis as we go into an anterior pelvic tilt it's kind of like the tailbone going up to the ceiling the front part of your pelvis dropping down to the ground that's actually closing down the hip joint so your pelvis moving into that position is the same relative motion as your femur moving up into flexion. That is hip flexion yep. movement, right? You just don't think about it that way because maybe you're not a movement specialist, but that is the difference between an open chain and a closed chain movement. Yes. So if I'm standing and my femur is fixed, but my pelvis is moving over my femur, that's my hip joint still moving and my spine a little bit, depending on what's going on, but that is me going into hip flexion. So if I'm starting in hip flexion, I'm not gonna have a lot of room to go into more hip flexion. So does that mean you need to fix your anterior your pelvic tilt so that you're in neutral all the time no but can it help you understand that if you want to go into a squat which requires a lot of hip flexion starting in maybe more of a quote-unquote neutral or just away from the end range might give you a little bit more options so that you don't run out of space and get a pinch earlier um, as you descend into hip flexion so hopefully that kind of yeah. makes and maybe sense. you don't actually get a pinch but as you go into that deeper part of the squat you just totally round out your back or you get that quote-unquote butt wink and that's just because you're trying to open up space to create more room to get into hip flexion right and at the end of your squat Almost everybody's going to have right. some butt wink, right? So that's like normal. Yeah, if you're like total ass to grass, you're yes. going to have some because lumbar flexion. You, because you do run, you run out of room in the joint socket, right? It's if we're having it like super early um, that it can be something that we might want to look into. Um, and it's especially problematic if we don't have any control of our lumbar spine flexion, which is what the butt wink is going into. It's going into a lumbar spine flexion. And we don't have any control or we've never built strength there. Then we're adding, now we're going to that movement with a lot of load and a squat. And um, if we're loading the squat, by the way, body weight's probably fine. But yep. um, we just want to make sure we prepare the tissues because that's when tissues are not prepared and they have too much load on them, that's where an injury occurs. So I like that Ryan wanted to bring that up because the closed chain movement of hip stuff is really important. And we do usually go through that with people for sure. But it's really, really hard to have awareness and like understand movement of closed chain movements because you usually just need to know what muscles are responsible for the movements in open chain because they're a little easier to feel and see versus closed chain gravity is involved. So you can kind of like 
I don't know if I want to say like fake the movement, but um, you can go into the movement without necessarily controlling it. And so we always start with open chain movements. And then from there, we want to teach people, okay, let's see what's going on and how we can make sure we're controlling closed chain movement. And from there, like controlling the pelvis really comes down to the muscles that also control your spine. Mm -hmm. And so this goes back to everything's connected and you can't just like focus only on one thing, um, but we always like to break things down first and then from there we can build upon them. And I think that's what we just did with this podcast. <laughs> yeah. No, this was good. I, I like this. I enjoyed this. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed it as well. I think it was very beneficial. Hopefully we made things easy enough to understand. And I think a lot of the stuff that we did talk about, Jen, did a fantastic job talking about in previous podcast episodes. So if there's something that just totally doesn't make sense to you, definitely check some of those episodes out because it spends a whole 30 minutes or an hour on those specific topics themselves. And then this kind of brings it all back together from like a, an assessment standpoint and an understanding of movement standpoint. Yeah, I think this was great. And for Ryan to say that he loved it is awesome because Ryan does not love doing these things always. Um, when I first told him he was going to come on, he was like, what? No, damn it. Like, yeah, I she didn't know. even give me like questions or anything. We just, we uh, winged this today. Yeah. I wanted, it's a little bit easier when you're, when you're kind of having a conversation back and forth. Um, what he doesn't realize is we practice these podcasts all the time because sure. we go on at least two long walks with the dog every single day. And guess what our talks are? <laughs> it's this stuff and I think this has been ever since undergrad I remember one because we started dating in high school when we were like 17 and then we went to the same college I think we had planned on already going to the same college and we studied the same thing we were in the same classes together um fun fact nobody knew we were dating um, which was really <laughs> funny but at one dinner with Ryan's mom she was we were talking about something and it was probably about school at the time in undergrad and she was like, is this what your conversations always are like? And we looked at each other like, what What do you mean? She's like, you're just throwing all these terms around and anatomy and movement. And she, she was like, is this how you guys always talk at dinner? And we, we were laughing because we didn't realize that it's like. She's listening to this. I know that yeah, she'll, she, not, she not now is. because that would be in the future. But, yeah, but <laughs> she's, she is going to definitely yeah, remember this conversation <laughs> and that statement <laughs> but like we always have so i figured why not take some of these conversations and record them and put them on a podcast for people to learn from um because ryan's mom thought it was really cool she was like i have no idea what the hell you're talking about really but i think it's fascinating to hear the two of you um chatter about all of the things that you guys are so passionate about and like we've always been obsessed about this and like always been so obsessed with listening to other podcasts to learn and then we we converse about them so I think that this was a really good option for us to do and and I think it's easier to bounce back and forth off of these so I'll probably still do some solo podcasts but when it comes to dissecting different movements and um, body parts you're going to hear more from Ryan so if you loved it let us know so that we can reinforce Ryan coming back here yeah and if you love any of the episodes we greatly appreciate if you leave a review on itunes yes. helps us a ton very yes. appreciative and if you already have um we love you and thank you so much and these take a lot of time and effort but they're also something i'm really passionate about and kind of love doing too so any little support that you give is just so so appreciated um, and with that being said, I think we're going to close out the podcast. So thanks for tuning into this podcast and we will see you on the next one. Mm -hmm.